Oligarchs control a vast amount of wealth and influence in Russia today. How did these business titans rise to power, and what is their relationship to the government? U.S. President Joe Biden and other world leaders are setting their sights on Russia's oligarchs as they seek new ways to punish Vladimir Putin and those who have enabled him and profited from his reign for waging war in Ukraine. Today, we'll tell you how Putin created Russia's oligarchs. Number 10. Who are the oligarchs? Russia's original oligarchs included some of its earliest entrepreneurs from when Mikhail Gorbachev loosened the strictures of Communist Party control in the late 1980s. They made fortunes in the 1990s as Russia under Yeltsin was transformed from the capital of the Soviet Union into a primitive state of capitalism. Yeltsin's government expedited that process by privatizing state assets at deep discounts, putting massive wealth in the hands of a select few, some of whom then struck a deal to use their fortunes and media assets to help Yeltsin defeat a resurgent Communist Party to win re-election in 1996. That deal came to be known as loans for shares as the government placed its cash in the banks of oligarchs, took the money back as loans, and then defaulted on them. In essence, the oligarchs got state assets in exchange for state money. Significantly, these oligarchs also exerted sway on Yeltsin's administration, influencing policy and in some cases serving in formal government positions. Number 9. What became of that group? A few remained active in business, Vladimir Putanin, Russia's wealthiest individual, who heads MMC Norilsk Nickel, PJSC, the world's largest producer of refined nickel and palladium, and Mikhail Fridman and Petrov Ven, whose commercial bank, Alpha Bank, became the anchor business of Alpha Group, a holding company that today owns interest in telecommunications and retail. Others fared considerably less well after Putin succeeded Yeltsin in 2000. Mikhail Kordakovsky was stripped of his wealth and imprisoned for a decade on tax evasion and money laundering charges that he says were retributions for supporting political parties opposed to Putin. Freed in 2013, he lives in exile in London and continues to criticize Putin. Boris Berezovsky and Vladimir Gazinsky fled Russia as they faced similar jeopardy. Berezovsky was found dead at his home near London in 2013. Alexander Smolensky largely dropped from public view after 2005. Number 8. Oligarchs Lose Their Grip, Keep Their Wealth In the 1990s, the oligarchs had the upper hand with the Kremlin and could even dictate policy at times. Under Yeltsin, multiple oligarchs assumed formal positions in the government, and anecdotes abound describing coffers of cash being carried into the Kremlin in exchange for political favors. But since the 2000s, Putin has been calling the shots. Essentially, Putin proposed a deal. The oligarchs would stay out of politics, and the Kremlin would stay out of their businesses and leave their often illegitimate gains alone. Furthermore, popular disappointment with the privatization of the 1990s facilitated its partial rollback in the 2000s. Putin's Kremlin applied political pressure on oligarchs in strategic industries like media and natural resources to sell controlling stakes back to the state. Putin also passed laws that gave preferential treatment to the so-called state corporations. These moves secured the Kremlin's control over the economy and over the oligarchs. Number 7. The Three Shades of Oligarchy Today, three types of oligarchs stand out in terms of their proximity to power. First comes Putin's friends, who are personally connected to the president. Many of Putin's close friends, particularly those from his St. Petersburg and KGB days, have experienced a meteoric rise to extreme wealth. The second group includes leaders of Russia's security services, the police, and the military. 
known as Salaviki, who have also leveraged their network to amass extreme personal wealth. Finally, the largest number of Russian oligarchs are outsiders without personal connection to Putin, the military, or the FSB. Indeed, some current outsiders are the 1990s-era oligarchs, while Putin selectively crushed politically inconvenient or obstreperous oligarchs after coming to power, he did not seek to systematically eliminate oligarchs as a class, as he had promised during his initial election campaign. Number 6. Putin's Enablers Make no mistake, regardless of their type, the oligarchs have helped Putin stay in power through their political crescents and economic support of the Kremlin's domestic initiatives. Furthermore, my research highlights instances in which oligarchs use their wealth in terms of jobs, loans, and donations to influence politicians in other countries. For example, in 2014, the Russian bank FCRB lent 9.4 million euros, that's 10.3 million US dollars, to the populist anti-EU party of Marine Le Pen in France, creating a political debt to Russia. And in 2016, Luke Oil, Russia's second largest oil company, paid a $1.4 million government fine for Martin Najedli, a key advisor to the Czech president in 2016, which allowed Najedli to keep his influential position. Furthermore, my research on the concealment of corporate political activity suggests that using ostensibly non-political intermediaries such as private companies is a key strategy through which organizations like the Kremlin can hide their political activity. Number 5. Putin's Hostages this brings us to the most important question on many people's minds. As the sanctions dissipate oligarchs' wealth, could that prompt them to abandon Putin or change the course of the war? Some oligarchs are already speaking out against the war, such as Alpha Group Chairman Mikhail Fridman and metals magnate Oleg Deripaska, both of whom have been sanctioned by the West. Luke Oil also called for the war's end. Although Luke Oil is not currently under direct sanctions, oil traders are already shunning its products in anticipation. I believe we'll see increasingly vocal opposition to the war from the oligarchs. The Kremlin, for its part, has promised state support to sanctioned companies, especially in the banking sector. More importantly, it is the guns, not the money, that speak loudest in the Kremlin today. As long as Putin retains his control over the Salaviki, the current and former military and intelligence officers close to Putin, the other oligarchs, in my view, will remain hostages to his regime. Number 4. Who are today's oligarchs? Some Russians who accumulated wealth in the Yeltsin era further prospered under Putin. They include well-known multi-billionaires Oleg Deripaska, Roman Abramovich, Alisher Umanov, Viktor Vexelberg, Mikhail Prokhorov, and Bajit Alexparov. In Putin's People, How the KGB Took Back Russia and Then Took Over the West, 2020, Catherine Belton points to a new case of oligarchs, all of them Putin's KGB-connected associates from St. Petersburg whom Putin installed at the helm of strategic sectors of the economy in a process that became known as Kremlin Inc. Number three, do they all steer clear of politics? Pretty much as memories remain vivid of Kordorkovsky's 10 years in prison, the oligarch's tactic agreement not to criticize Putin was on display after Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th. Several Russian billionaires issued statements criticizing the conflict, but stopping short of condemning Putin himself. Fridman told Bloomberg that to say anything to Putin against the war for anybody would be kind of suicide. Number two, can they sway Putin? That's the hope, at least behind sanctioning him. But the Russian billionaires who have been sanctioned say they have little influence over Putin. Fridman, who owns a stake in one of Russia's biggest banks, said he's never even met Putin one-on-one. -on -one. Number one, 
Are all Russian billionaires oligarchs? The U.S. Treasury Department seemed to suggest so in 2018 when it published a list of 96 purported oligarchs that was virtually identical to Forbes magazine's roster of Russian billionaires. But while it's true that many of the country's billionaires have the super yachts and luxury real estate that have been associated with the oligarch lifestyle, many haven't been sanctioned by Western governments so far. As to what level of wealth, private sector power, and Kremlin connections makes a billionaire an oligarch, that's in the eye of the beholder. What are your thoughts about Russian oligarchs? Please subscribe to The Luxury World. Thanks for watching.